Well, thank you, uh, Linda and Catherine, for the invitation to join you this morning. Uh, Linda and Catherine have given me a very um, uh, uh, detailed list of topics that they'd like me to cover. Uh, and actually, these are the things that I've been working on for the past 30 years or so as a clinician and researcher. So we'll talk about POTS, uh, orthostatic intolerance, and autonomic dysfunction in ME-CFS. I don't have any uh, relationships uh, with any of the uh, commercial products or providers of services that we'll be talking about, but we will talk about some, at least in the United States, unapproved uh, uses of medication, mainly because most of the medicines that we use for treating orthostatic intolerance have not been approved for that purpose, but there's a lot of good science behind their, these choices. Uh, the way I want to structure the talk is, at least in the first half, to talk about the clinical features that allow us to recognize the common uh, forms of orthostatic intolerance. We'll talk a little bit about methods of uh, making the diagnosis and testing for this, and then uh, look at the overlaps with MECFS. Uh, and then the last half of the talk really is going to focus on the approach that we've developed to treating both POTS and orthostatic intolerance syndromes within the context of MECFS. Uh, I think we've got lots of times for time for questions, and I've got a number of cases at the end that I think will help uh, tie these ideas together. So by orthostatic intolerance, this is a term that refers to a group of clinical conditions in which symptoms worsen when you're in a quiet upright posture, and that can be either sitting for a long period or standing still. And many of those symptoms, but not all of them, are improved uh, as soon as you lie down. So for example, fatigue and brain fog can persist for quite a long time once they've been provoked after you assume a recumbent position. The reason I've emphasized that this is a group of clinical conditions is that every now and then you'll hear that somebody is saying that POTS or postural tachycardia syndrome is the only form of orthostatic intolerance on a chronic basis uh, in ME-CFS, and that's simply not true, and I'll, I'll try and uh, convince you of that as we go. The big challenge physi physiologically when we move from a supine position to standing, as you can see in this diagram from uh, Philip Lowe's book on autonomic disorders, is that in the standing position, there's a much greater shift of blood down into the lower half of the body. This cartoon is not particularly good at showing that a lot of blood actually pools in the abdominal cavity. Uh, but it's thought that somewhere between 500 and 750 milliliters of blood uh, shifts to the lower half of the body. Some would say even 1,000 mils. And in response to that, most of us have a, an immediate uh, reduction in arterial pressure. And then the, the um, sensing mechanisms in the big vessels of the uh, chest and neck, the baroreceptors, uh, are not being stretched as much. That causes them to send a message to the cardiovascular centers in the brainstem. And they respond to this drop in pressure with a big increase in the output of sympathetic nervous system activity. That includes uh, release of norepinephrine from nerves and epinephrine from the adrenal glands or uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline. That leads to about a 10 or 20 beat increase in heart rate. You get a bit more vigorous contraction of the heart. But the biggest uh, change is that the vessels start to constrict. And that uh, allows us to stay upright, standing for long periods of time. That's the normal response. If that is not working well, you get these symptoms of orthostatic intolerance. And I want to break this slide down into two uh, Two, two different slides. Okay, so when we talk about orthostatic intolerance, that refers to a group of clinical conditions, not just POTS, uh, where symptoms worsen when you're in a quiet, upright position, like sitting for long periods of time or standing, and many of those symptoms, but not all of them, improve fairly soon after lying down. The, the, the exceptions to that rule are that once they have been provoked, fatigue and brain fog can persist for quite a while after one lies down. 
This is the slide on the normal uh, response to standing. The big challenge for us as humans is that you shift about 500 to 750 milliliters of blood. Some would say even a liter of blood into the lower half of the body when you stand. And this shows the increase in the blood in the legs here. Doesn't uh, illustrate the fact that there's actually quite a lot of blood that pools in the abdominal cavity as well. Uh, and in response to that, you get a, a minor reduction in arterial pressure. The arterial baroreceptors are the sensing uh, uh, part of the nervous system that notice that the, they are not being stretched. These are big uh, receptors in the large vessels of the chest and neck. And uh, they send an alarm message to the cardiovascular centers in the brainstem. And the response to this is an increase in sympathetic nerve activity that releases noradrenaline or norepinephrine from the nerves and uh, adrenaline or epinephrine from the adrenal glands. These substances combine to increase heart rate by about 10 or 20 beats, give a bit more forceful uh, uh, contraction of the ventricle of the heart, and the biggest effect is that they can uh, cause the vessels to constrict. That then shoves that blood back up to the heart and brain so that we can remain standing. Uh, these are the symptoms that we see when that process does not work efficiently. These are the symptoms of orthostatic intolerance, which can be broken down into two categories. The ones on the left are thought to be due to a reduction in cerebral blood flow, brain blood flow. And these make sense, uh, lightheadedness. We've all experienced that if we stand up too quickly, syncope or fainting. Uh, if you're not getting enough blood flow to the brain, you can have a big reduction in the ability to concentrate. So this leads to all sorts of cognitive problems and brain fog. Headache is common uh, in orthostatic disorders. So is blurred vision. All forms of orthostatic intolerance that I've been able to uh, identify have uh, a higher prevalence of fatigue than would be expected. And many uh, have an, an intolerance of low impact exercise. So those are the symptoms on the, the left side. The ones on the right are thought to be due to an exaggerated sympathetic or hyperadrenergic response. And these can include an orthostatic dyspnea or shortness of breath that uh, starts when people have a, a critical reduction in the amount of blood getting to the brain. This can look like people are hyperventilating or panicking, but it's really a physiologic response to not, get, not having enough blood coming back to the heart. Chest pain is common, so are palpitations or uh, a sense of cardiac awareness. Tremulousness and anxiety are common, and those of us who are uh, my age and older who used to treat children with asthma uh, in the emergency room with consecutive every 15 minute shots of adrenaline uh, know that that, that uh, uh, drug will cause a lot of shaking and anxiety. So this is these are uh, physiologic responses to the amount of adrenaline that's circulating. People can get diaphoresis or sweating and nausea as well. Uh, this slide summarizes a, a large literature on the um, mechanisms behind orthostatic intolerance. In other words, why, why do some people get this problem? And it seems to be that they have either an excessive amount of blood pooling in the limbs, more than average, or some sort of defect in the ability of, that, of the vessels of the lower part of the body to constrict and send the blood back up. In addition, many studies have uh, at, of especially of people with ME have shown that there's a reduction in the amount of blood volume in the circulation by about 10% or so. It's unclear why this occurs, but these two factors combined, if you then stand the person up or do a tilt table test, lead to a significant reduction in brain blood flow. That elicits this big sympathetic uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system adrenal response. And then the ultimate pattern that one sees, uh, it can be one of these conditions at the bottom that we'll work through. This one stands for instantaneous orthostatic hypotension, classical orthostatic hypotension, delayed, uh, neurally mediated hypotension, POTS. And then we're learning, uh, and I'll show you some of these data from your neighbors in Amsterdam, uh, that many people when they're upright can have a big reduction in brain blood flow, but no major change in heart rate or blood pressure. Uh, one of the physical findings that we see is shown here, 
and that is uh, a dependent acrocyanosis. Cyanosis refers to this reddish purple color. Uh, usually in medicine, it's when we aren't getting enough oxygen to the tissues. Uh, on the left, you see a, a, the hand of a college student. This girl had to stop her uh, college classes because of the degree of fatigue and lightheadedness. And this is a picture of her hand five minutes into a standing test with my hand as the color contrast. On the right, I've pressed my fingers against her skin looking for what is called capillary refill. Normally you get blood uh, back into the area you've compressed within about three seconds. But here I've pressed her skin, stepped back, uh, picked up my cell phone, found the camera icon, then focused and took the picture. So eight seconds later, she still has no capillary refill, really, really quite extraordinary. Uh, this is, these are diagrams, the next couple of slides, illustrating the different types of, of orthostatic intolerance. And this is borrowed from a recent paper in Lancet Neurology. Uh, the normal pattern uh, uh, as you move to standing is to have a bit of a reduction in blood pressure, but you recover very quickly. In part, that comes from the leg muscles pushing the blood that's pooled in the legs back up. There's a a condition called initial orthostatic hypotension when you get a more severe reduction of 40 millimeters of mercury within the first 15 seconds of standing. Uh, and this is fairly common in adolescents. And as long as that's all they have and they don't have any chronic impairment in their overall function, this doesn't need to be treated. They just need to get up a bit more gradually. Uh, this slide shows classic orthostatic hypotension where as soon as the person stands up, and these are seconds at the bottom. So this is, uh, orthostatic hypotension has to be a 20 millimeter drop, uh, 20 millimeter drop in systolic pressure uh, or 10 in diastolic pressure within the first three minutes of standing or doing a tilt test. This is much more common in older uh, adults. It could be common in uh, adolescents if they've had a lot of vomiting or diarrhea or some reason to be dehydrated or if they have an eating disorder. But we don't see this all that commonly. Delayed orthostatic hypotension refers to the fact that this same reduction in blood pressure occurs after the three minute point during the, the uh, orthostatic stress. These are the more common forms that we see in uh, ME-CFS. One is POTS or postural tachycardia syndrome. And you can see here that this is a person who has a normal heart rate in black when they're supine. We stand them, uh, and this person has a 51-beat increase in heart rate, along with reproduction of symptoms. And so POTS is defined as occurring uh, in the first 10 minutes of standing or head-up tilt testing. In adults, you need a 30-beat increase in heart rate. For adolescents, you need a 40-beat increase. You can't have the orthostatic hypotension that I just showed you. And this has to be more than just a heart rate change. These are patients who have to have chronic orthostatic symptoms. The heart rate often can exceed 120 beats per minute. What we call neurally mediated hypotension uh, is shown on the right. This is a medical student who was uh, fainting frequently. We put her on a head up tilt to 70 degrees, heart rate went up nine beats, and she became lightheaded and pale. And then at the five minute point, the bottom fell out. Uh, her systolic pressure dropped to below 50, which is not compatible with remaining conscious. Her heart rate came down at the same time. And she even had some tonic clonic seizure movements due to that rapid reduction of brain blood flow. So this is the most common cause of recurrent syncope at all ages. Uh, it's more common in women, in part because they begin with a lower resting blood pressure. It's uh, very common in adolescents and in those who have a, a low normal or low blood pressure, somewhere in the 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury range. It can be uh, seen fairly commonly after infection. Often there's a family history. And in the past, the routine physical examination and laboratory tests were normal. So this group of largely female patients often were patronized and told, uh, aren't you lucky, dear? Your blood pressure is so low, you'll never have a stroke. Well, that wasn't what the patients were coming in uh, reporting. They had fatigue and fainting. Uh, 
the the drop in blood pressure is not usually detected as rapidly as I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and the median time to see this in our studies has been 29 minutes in our ME-CFS patients. But people are very symptomatic as soon as you put them up. And this is a condition where the reflex interaction between the heart and the brain uh, leads to a generation of many hours of fatigue after the fainting episode. So this, this can uh, persist for 48 to 72 hours. And we think that every time people are upright, they're partially activating this reflex pathway and then generating a debt of fatigue that they cannot sleep off. POTS uh, is, uh, has gained prominence in the past 25 years, but it had been described as early as the 1870s. And in that era, it was termed irritable heart syndrome, effort syndrome, or neurocirculatory asthenia or exhaustion. Uh, it has a much higher female uh, preponderance. The, the female to male ratio is about four to one. We, we do not see it that commonly under the age of 10. And if we do see it under the age of 10, I tell our trainees to look for other causes. Uh, it has a very gradual insidious onset in some patients, but more commonly appears after a, an infection. And lately we are seeing this uh, at a very high rate after COVID. Uh, it can follow immunization. I know Dr. Brint has uh, written about this and it can occur after surgery or trauma. Uh, we do not understand all the causes or mechanisms for this. But the symptoms can be quite disabling. And I think we've seen a big increase in the recognition and the incidence of this problem in the last 20 years or so. Here's an example of one of our uh, patients that we've seen uh, after COVID. This is a young woman who uh, got very lightheaded uh, initially with her uh, mild respiratory infection. She was never, she didn't have low oxygen. She didn't require hospitalization, but from the very beginning, she couldn't even stay upright in her chair working at, at her computer. Uh, this is a research scientist who within uh, two weeks of, of COVID was so lightheaded that she couldn't understand the numbers on her bank statement. So we did a 10-minute uh, standing test in her case, and she uh, had a resting heart rate that was uh, 89. And she went up uh, as soon as she stood up and kept going up till a peak heart rate of 166, just standing still. And this was associated with a big increase in lightheadedness, brain fog, and fatigue. Uh, POTS and neurally mediated or vasovagal hypotension can occur together. Here's an example of somebody who had a 44 beat change in heart rate in the first 10 minutes of upright tilt, uh, along with reproduction of all of the symptoms you see at the top. And then eventually at the 20 minute point, you see this characteristic drop in blood pressure accompanied by a drop in heart rate that helps you make the diagnosis. When we're taking the history from especially adolescent patients, they often are not aware that, uh, that what they're feeling with orthostatic symptoms is different than others. They think everybody feels the way they feel. So you have to ask them uh, a number of questions, like how long can you stand still before you feel unwell? And we ask very specifically, how do you feel in the settings uh, such as waiting in line uh, or, or uh, shopping at the mall? And our joke with the trainees is that if you've got an adolescent who cannot go to the shopping mall because of symptoms, then you're dealing with a true medical problem uh, 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 and, uh, and not something behavioral. Uh, we ask them what happens if you're standing at a cocktail reception or uh, if you're in a choir or at a religious service. Uh, and heat can bring on orthostatic intolerance as well. So how do they do in a hot shower, bath, or sauna? Uh, and uh, often our patients will tell us that they have to sit down in the shower or lie down for 20 minutes afterwards to recover. Uh, some of them have a, a lot of trouble in the summertime, and uh, so if they're standing outside on a hot day, that can bring on symptoms. We ask them, uh, do they feel lightheaded or unwell if they're standing for, for more than five minutes? And some of the adolescents will say, no, I don't have lightheadedness, but I get what, at least in the US, the adolescents call a head rush. Well, a head rush is a, is a sensation of lightheadedness. 
Uh, other clues are uh, that patients will often study in a reclining position because they get more blood flow to their brain. They sit with their knees uh, brought up to their chest or their feet under them. Uh, and many of them fidget and move around when they're standing to try and use the muscles of the legs as a pump to bring the blood back up. To identify these problems, uh, what are called orthostatic vital signs, where you measure the heart rate and blood pressure lying down, sitting, and standing, these are often done over less than two minutes. And that's an insufficient amount of time to identify most forms of chronic orthostatic intolerance. We usually need prolonged testing at least for 10 minutes to provoke symptoms. So uh, among the tests you can do are uh, standing tests, uh, usually for 10 minutes. One is a passive standing test, meaning that the person leans back against the wall. Uh, the active standing test is without any support. The person is just uh, standing in the middle of the room. We prefer the passive standing test because it reduces uh, patient movement. And then the next is the more formal test is the head up tilt test. Uh, this is done in a laboratory where you've got uh, quiet, dim lighting and a comfortable temperature. There's usually an electrocardiogram recording and you can see here the table that has a footboard and the patient is strapped in with seat belts so that if they lose consciousness and muscle tone, they don't injure themselves uh, with fainting. Uh, you have to have a, a laboratory technician or a physician in attendance because of the, the uh, risk of losing uh, consciousness. Uh, before the test, ideally people have nothing by mouth, NPO, for two to four hours, and we don't want them on medicines that could possibly be treating the, uh, the, the hypotension. But that's not always uh, practical or ethical. So for example, if somebody is on uh, an antidepressant, uh, it would not necessarily be, uh, it, it could be unethical to stop that, even though it has some effect on the vasculature. Uh, usually people are supine for 20 to 45 minutes and then the table is brought to a 70 degree upright position for between 10 and 45 minutes. Uh, some use uh, a second stage where we administer a, an adrenaline-like uh, compound to drive up heart rate somewhat. Um, we have found that when we look at our patients with POTS, uh, you can pick up some of them, about half of them, within the first three minutes of standing, but uh, you continue uh, having people meet the heart rate criteria for POTS the longer they stand. Uh, but And you'd think that the ones who get to the heart rate criteria in the first three minutes might be sicker than the ones here, but there's actually no difference. And so uh, this, this is a, a point that emphasizes that you can't uh, abbreviate the test or you'll miss the diagnosis. Another interesting phenomenon is that often adolescents uh, especially come in and their heart rate's a bit elevated compared to what you'd expect before the test. And so here's a 16-year-old who gets a 38-beat change in heart rate, not quite meeting POTS criteria, but is very symptomatic, and probably the symptoms count more than anything else. Uh, when we look at the post-test heart rate, it's a bit lower and closer to what we would expect. So if we use this as the baseline heart rate, this is a 48 beat per minute change meeting the criteria for POTS. And so if we use the post-test period to, to measure the baseline heart rate, uh, we can pick up 15% more patients. So let me discuss some of the overlaps with ME-CFS. Uh, we had been very interested in uh, the, the potential for these circulatory problems to be a cause of chronic fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome and published uh, our first paper on this back in 1995. We had seven patients, all of whom developed hypotension during a tilt test. And uh, four of the seven improved, uh, had an improvement in their fatigue and function when we treated the circulation problem. We went on to a larger study that was controlled in both adolescents and adults. And we did this with my colleagues, Isam Bohalega, who's from Saudi Arabia, and Hugh Calkins, who runs the electrophysiology laboratory at Johns Hopkins. And uh, that study brought out a number of features that, that um, I think were important. One is that when we asked MECFS patients, did they have lightheadedness, 96% endorsed that symptom. 83% had excessive sweating. 78% had blurring of their vision and 43% had fainted at some point before. 
the conditions that made their fatigue worse included, as you'd expect for this condition, physical exertion, but also some of the things that would bring on orthostatic intolerance. So a hot shower, prolonged standing, a hot environment, and then any time that they were lightheaded or had fainted. Uh, the symptoms that they had during the first 45 minutes of upright tilt included worse fatigue in all of them. So we could make them have a bad day with their illness. Uh, most of them had lightheadedness and felt hot and many felt nauseous, whereas the control group were simply bored. When we looked at the tilt testing, 22 of 23 in the ME group uh, versus only uh, four of the sorry, 14 of the uh, 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 controls uh, developed hypotension, and none of the controls developed hypotension in the first 45 minutes. So this was really quite a striking abnormality. Uh, and what I think was more interesting uh, for those who have the illness is that when we treated patients uh, with medications used to treat recurrent syncope and orthostatic intolerance, including fludrocortisone, beta blockers, mitodrin, and others, their overall sense of well-being went up from 35 at baseline to 70 after four months of treatment. So this, this could be a relatively modest improvement as you see here, or really quite a dramatic improvement. And this really is the kind of response we still see. Maybe it's a bit better now because we have more tools. All of the studies that have been done in pediatrics show that orthostatic intolerance is much more common in pediatric ME-CFS. Here's one uh, from Julian Stewart in the US where 96% of their patients had orthostatic intolerance and three quarters of them had the acrocyanosis I showed you earlier. Uh, Tanaka in Japan used just a seven minute period of active standing showing a delayed uh, recovery of the brain oxygenation in three quarters of the patients but only 10% of the control controls. And Vigard Willer in Norway uh, had decided to use just a 20 degree upright angle, really not much more than lying, you'd, you'd feel lying down on the sofa. And yet that was enough of an orthostatic stress to accentuate the difference between patients and healthy controls. In adults, it was thought for a while that only 40% of patients had orthostatic intolerance, but that has changed with some very good data from your neighbors, uh, Linda Van Kampen and Franz Visser in Amsterdam. Uh, we met at a meeting in 2017, and they asked me to help out with some of the English language writing, but these are all their data from their studies in their clinic uh, in Amsterdam. And they had a huge group of MECFS adults, 429, as well as 44 controls. 28% of their patients had POTS, 14% had delayed orthostatic hypotension, and 58% had a normal heart rate and blood pressure response. So you might have been tempted to think that these folks were normal. But I'll go back a slide. What they came up with was a new method of measuring brain blood flow uh, and having an actual uh, uh, quantitation by putting their uh, uh, Doppler probe on each for, uh, uh, each uh, um, uh, carotid uh, artery, uh, internal carotid artery, and each vertebral artery. So they, it took about two minutes to collect all that data, uh, but then they could tell you the the total brain blood flow. So this slide shows that for healthy people, between supine and 30 minutes of standing on the tilt test, there was a seven percent reduction in brain blood flow. When you take all of the MECFS patients together, there was a 26% reduction. So almost a fourfold greater reduction in brain blood flow. Uh, and 90% of the adult MECFS patients uh, had significantly lower uh, brain blood flow than the healthy controls. If you break down that 26%, uh, the ones who had POTS or delayed orthostatic hypotension had a greater degree of uh, of reduction, but even those who had a normal heart rate and blood pressure, uh, in whom we might have been tempted to say there's nothing wrong, they had a 24% reduction in brain blood flow. So I think it's no wonder that they had trouble thinking, concentrating, and paying attention and responding uh, in conversation. This is a, a, a another slide uh, showing the Doppler images from these uh, studies. Here's um, at the bottom the uh, 
Doppler uh, showing the left carotid artery flow supine and then standing in a healthy individual who has about an 8% reduction in brain blood flow. Contrast that with a long COVID patient who had both POTS and MET criteria for ME-CFS, and you can see a whopping 39% reduction in brain blood flow. And when they look at their first group of long COVID patients, all of whom had POTS, all of whom met criteria for ME-CFS, they had overall a 33% reduction in brain blood flow. They compared them to uh, uh, 20 patients in each group uh, from their database, ME-CFS patients who had POTS and those who had a normal heart rate and blood pressure, and showed that while these were still way worse than healthy controls, they didn't uh, match the amount of brain blood flow in the long COVID patients. And this is interesting because people sometimes argue that, oh, the ME-CFS patients have orthostatic intolerance because they're deconditioned. But uh, the people who'd been sick the longest in, in these groups, uh, sick for between five and 10 years, had way less reduction in brain blood flow than the ones who'd been sick for just six to 12 months. And there's other evidence that shows that deconditioning simply does not explain the physiology in ME-CFS patients. Uh, uh, Linnea and Catherine had asked me to say, well, what's the difference between uh, CFS and POTS? And one of the studies that's looked at that uh, showed that if you took the old Fukuda criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome and looked at the prevalence of severe fatigue, the ones who had CFS and POTS uh, had a greater prevalence of fatigue than the ones who had POTS without meeting the CFS criteria. And all along, you see that many patients with POTS can have a lot of overlap with the features of ME-CFS, but they might not meet all of the criteria. So there's a there, there's mainly a big overlap. Uh, somebody wanted to know if you will address CCI, AAI, and the possible connection with ME during your talk here. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna cover that. Um, and if we have time at the end, I wanna go in great detail into uh, one case uh, of a person who had CCI and uh, show you how she's done over time. So the, the second half of the talk really is to discuss uh, the approach to treating POTS and orthostatic intolerance syndromes. Uh, uh, and I'll give you a heavy dose of our approach and what we think we've learned over the last 30 years of, of addressing these problems. Uh, but much of this is shared by the uh, international uh, community that deals with POTS uh, and orthostatic intolerance. So these, this is not all novel work. So when we're treating orthostatic intolerance, we begin with non-pharmacologic measures. So we're just using, uh, 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 and I'll, I'll go into those. We wanna treat any con medical conditions that might be part of the syndrome. And this is perhaps where our approach is different than what you'll hear from others in that we really focus on treating these other factors that contribute. And, and this is where you need more than just the cardiologist to help out. Step three of treating orthostatic intolerance is to use either single drugs or what I call rational polytherapy, meaning uh, medications for more than one class of drugs. So uh, when we talk about the non-pharmacologic measures, uh, that really begins with the, a common sense observation that where possible, avoid the factors that precipitate symptoms. So if we go back to our diagram of where, where the problems come in. It's a reduction, uh, it's an in increased amount of pooling of blood in the uh, lower half of the body, a, a reduction in blood volume, and an increased sympathoadrenal response. So increased pooling and uh, decreased blood volume occur with prolonged sitting or standing. So we wanna try and emphasize that our patients need to get up and move around if they're going to be in a seated position for, for any length of time. So students who are studying really need to take breaks every 20 minutes, get up, move around, uh, and, and we want them uh, to avoid prolonged standing. So this means on a practical basis, not going to the store during the time that everybody else is there, but trying to shop at the times that are not the peak times for everyone else. They need to watch that they're not in an overly warm environment. So in the shower, that might mean uh, cooler shower temperatures, avoiding saunas. Uh, many people, when we were beginning our research, had been told, uh, since there, nobody knew how to treat ME-CFS, that the best thing for them would be to eat a healthy diet. And in some uh, uh, settings, a healthy diet means reducing your sodium. But that will actually make 
patients with orthostatic intolerance much worse. So that advice cannot be applied to everybody in the population without causing harm. And many of the patients came in initially with really very reduced sodium intakes, and they needed uh, much more sodium in the diet. Prolonged bed rest uh, can contribute to orthostatic intolerance. So we want to try and encourage people to be upright and not in bed all the time where possible. This becomes a bit of a challenge for the more severely uh, affected patients. In adults, varicose veins can be a source of blood pooling. Uh, in people with orthostatic hypotension, sometimes a very high carbohydrate intake leads to more blood shunting to the intestinal circulation. And so many of our patients do better with uh, a lower amount of sweets, uh, frequent small meals higher in protein and fat than they are in carbo carbohydrates. We also want to make sure that our patients don't have uh, medicines on board that are causing increased pooling or reduced blood volume. So diuretic uh, agents that, inc that decrease your blood volume, uh, vasodilating medications, drugs for nausea uh, like uh, uh, um, chlorpromazine or, or uh, other medications can sometimes cause increased pooling, as can many of the modern antipsychotic drugs. And then, of course, it's important to think about alcohol, which everybody knows causes flushing of the face and increased urination, both of which would be bad for our patients. And many of the young women who have orthostatic intolerance uh, joke that they, they are a cheap date because they get much sicker and much more uh, giddy with a small volume of alcohol, say a half a glass of wine is enough to make them uh, unwell. Uh, the other thing is that if you have any increase in sympathoadrenal response and your catecholamine levels, the epinephrine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline, uh, if those are already increased when you're upright, anything that causes a further increase uh, can make matters worse. So this is where stress can cause a translation into physical symptoms. Pain can do the same thing, drops in blood sugar. And then uh, medicines that are sometimes used to treat uh, asthma can also do the same thing. So if we get an asthmatic who's very shaky after using their salbutamol or albuterol puffer, uh, we need to switch them to some other treatment. An older non-pharmacologic measure that might not be applicable to everybody was published back in 1944, and this was to raise the head of the bed. And you can see the, the headboard is up on these chairs, and this man has a pillow to stop him from sliding uh, out of the bed. And this, uh, uh, mech this uh, technique causes the kidney to make less urine at night, so you awaken in the morning with a higher blood volume. Uh, and this was all they had back in the 1940s to treat people along with a high sodium diet. But a group in the Netherlands actually uh, replicated this study uh, in, 19, in the early 1990s. So this is tolerated by some. It probably is not the right thing to do for the most severely affected patients for whom a, a, even a 20 degree head up angle can cause a reduction in brain blood flow. Uh, we usually accomplish this by putting two red bricks under the headboard. Uh, uh, so we don't use as high an angle as you see in this picture. Compression garments can help uh, reduce the amount of blood that is sitting in the legs. And we try to use uh, support hose that have a 20 to 30 millimeter of mercury pressure. There are uh, tighter compression garments, but these can be a bit tougher to pull on and off. And especially if you have joint uh, laxity and hypermobility, that can cause a bit, of, bit too much strain on the hands. Uh, the amount of area covered matters, so if you've got waist-high stockings, they're better than thigh-high, and those are better than knee-high. Uh, some people like these body shaper garments that go from the upper abdomen to the top of the thigh, and then you can get these cheap abdominal binders that cause abdominal compression. One of the things that many patients use without knowing why are postural counter maneuvers that employ the, the leg muscles as a pump. If the veins are not constricting adequately, you can compress them from outside with stockings or with your big leg muscles. So many people will stand with their legs crossed as this woman is doing. Uh, sometimes even the heel of a boot causes the calf muscles to be more engaged and contracted and that will help uh, with tolerating upright posture. <laughs> 
Squatting can get blood out of the legs, as can sitting with the knees to the chest or leaning forward when you're sitting. Uh, when students are at a desk or people are working at a desk, we have them get their knees a bit higher than their hips because that will help improve blood pressure. Uh, and then others have published a technique where you clench your fists when you're starting to stand up, and this helps pump the blood out of the arms. We don't recommend this to students in school because it looks like they're about to start a fight. These are pictures of our patients using these postural countermaneuvers. Here's somebody standing in this cocktail party pose. This is the knee chest position. This is this same girl has her legs really wrapped around uh, one another like a snake. Uh, seating with sitting with one leg uh, under you and you can see this girl in the upper right driving with her left leg up on the seat uh, so all of these are common maneuvers other non-pharmacologic measures uh, look at the fluid and salt intake and for most adolescents and adults we m want them minimally drinking two liters of fluid per day uh, and drinking every couple of hours, not waiting till the end of the school day to drink. Uh, they need access to fluids when they're at school. We want them to avoid sleeping more than 12 hours a day. And so what I recommend to the parents is after the child has been in bed for 12 hours, uh, especially if they're very somnolent at the beginning of the illness, uh, wake them up, give them something to drink, get them moving around again, then they can go back to bed. But if they sleep for 18 hours straight, they will awaken dehydrated and trigger all of these reflex pathways again. Uh, we use cooling garments for the hot weather. Uh, we avoid really extreme intakes of fluid. Anything beyond about four liters tends to be um, excessive and, and unnecessary. Uh, salt intake, we increase according to taste, adding salt to foods. And then if people don't have a high appetite for salt, we supplement that with salt tablets or oral rehydration solutions. These are some of the cooling garments that are used. Many people will use the neck wraps, as you see here. You can buy more expensive vests that have uh, pockets on the inner lining of the vest where you put uh, frozen um, ice uh, like packets, like you'd use for a picnic cooler. Uh, because people with multiple sclerosis have a lot of problems with temperature regulation, uh, many of the, the websites for multiple sclerosis can have these cooling garments, including a cooling beanie that is said to help people get to sleep. 